Today I will do my very very best to attempt to put the pieces together of this puzzle of what is going on in the digital realm with Ripple, with the EHKD, with this new stablecoin they have issued here, with uh, faster payment systems, with uh, Bitcoin, with the migration of um, or what happens after and during the halving with the migration and carnivorations, carnivorous behavior of Bitcoin mining and what we the architecture of we of what we could be potentially heading down in terms of cbdc's cbdc back stable coins stable coins and the architecture of them thank you guys for joining me on this journey i look forward to this one we're making moves we're making major moves we're making moves we're making major moves we're going all in like we got nothing to lose we're making moves we make it major moves. We make it moves. What is up, everybody? I'm Mr. Man. Welcome back to my channel. Man, it's been a year since I touched on this project here, and I'm excited to go through this again. Project Orem. I'm Mr. Man. If you haven't seen this face before, get familiar with it because I provide breakdown into these different projects by the BIS, by the different companies out there, and connect the pieces, connect the things that we haven't that we're having a hard time connecting. I spend my life doing this now. I'm also a property manager. I have my own hustles on the side going, but this is where my life is devoted right now. This is where I'm supposed to be. This came out prototype for a two-tiered central bank digital currency. And I'm learning now about the architectures of the stablecoin and CBDC and wholesale CBDC and CBDC-backed stablecoin. Listen to this stuff. So this is back here. This is back a year ago when I first touched on this project, BIS Project Orem plus Gold plus R3 plus Ripple. And let's see how far from the mark I was. Digital currency and why that's important. Nate Price had posted a couple days ago on Twitter, Ripple likes a two-tiered system. Why? What tier would XRP be if they want us to have a retail CBDC or e-money? Retail CBDC is also known as an R CBDC. Where we are going to focus today is just down here, the types of CBDCs. But before we go into that, let's jump into who is heading this project. Allow me to introduce you to Benedict Nolans. Benedict Nolans is the head of the regulatory affairs for Asia and Europe and CCO for Asia and Circle. You know Circle is USDC a board member of the Hong Kong FinTech Association and a member of the Global Digital Finance Advisory Council. Where else does she come from, I wonder? Hmm. Who would have figured? World Economic Forum. Well, why? Why does she have so much information about, like, stable coins, I wonder? Hmm. Very, very interesting. Ironically enough, Bitcoin former Goldman Sachs exec to join trading firm Circle. Goldman Sachs recognized that, and she also understands stable coins by working with those guys right there at Circle. Circle, the cryptocurrency exchange operator, has snagged a former Goldman Sachs executive to help navigate the murky regulatory waters as it expands globally. Business Insider has learned. Perfect. So I was on the money who with who Benedict Nolans is. Let's scroll through it. I missed a lot of key points back then because, you know, you learn and you grow and you learn. So, section one, scope of experimentation. Different types of retail CBDC, Orem Studies Intermediated CBDC, and CBDC-backed stablecoins. Intermediated CBDC, CBDC-backed stablecoins, trade-offs between different models, Environmental considerations, safety, flexibility, privacy. This is all important. Man, I wish I gave this to you guys earlier, but just be thankful you're getting it now. Section three, high level architecture, wholesale interbank system, the retail e-wallet system, and the CBDC operations. So the currency in the wholesale interbank system, retail e-wallet currencies, flow of the current of the CBDC token flow of the cbdc back stablecoin so those are two different types of cbdc's okay to break it down for you guys further a cbdc type token will be backed by fiat something that the west would do canada and us because canada has no gold we ain't got no gold don't got that 
And if we're buying gold, we're strengthening the, the value of the other, the BRICS countries over there, the BRICS formation, because they are purchasing gold to strengthen their currencies. U.S. is not. And Canada is not. U.S. is, but yeah, no, no. The need for banking uh, backing assets for both the CBDC token and the wholesale CBDC um, backed stable coin. And recently, what had happened? What had happened recently? Ripple had come out with a fiat backed uh, stable coin. In the, in the era of digitalization, central banks stand before a chosen, stand before a choice. Does retail central bank money need to go digital? And if so, how? Jointly embarking on the challenge to design a full-stack central bank digital currency CBDC system, the Bank for Inter International Settlements Innovation Hub, BISI, BISIH, sorry, Center in Hong Kong, HKMA, dubbed Project Aurum, the Latin word for gold, listen to this, reflecting our standing premise that digital currency issued under the auspice of the central bank must be as robust and trustworthy as gold. Through the creation of a technology stack com uh, comprised of a wholesale interbank system in which the wholesale CBDC or WCBDC is issued to banks for onward distribution to retail users and two, a retail e-wallet system in which the retail CBDC circulates among retail users, we set a goal to bring to life two very different types of retail tokens, intermediated CBDC, also referring to herein, um, the end of her project was executed, sorry, herein as a CBDC token and B, a CBDC backed stablecoin or in short, stablecoin. Ripple had just come out with a stablecoin backed with fiat, a wholesale CBDC um, stablecoin, sorry. So we have a, a, a stable coin, potentially a retail stable coin. To me, this seems like a scheme where a central bank, probably the reserve, will come in, wrap that CBDC, that stable coin, sorry. And now we have a wholesale stable coin or wholesale CBDC, also known as now just a CBDC. This is what I was saying before. Back in the day, a year ago, a year ago, that this is just known as a stable coin now, this CBDC. And this CBDC is just backed by fiat, fiat treasuries, right? Palau has been piloting, they're on phase two now, the offline phase um, portion of this pilot. They are um, uh, piloting a stable coin called the PSC, Palau stable coin. And that is backed by US treasuries, right? That's a wholesale CBDC, wholesale stable coin essentially. What could be the backing for that CBDC? Because that, that is a U.S. dollar-denominated currency location. Palau used, utilizes USD out in their island. So U.S. funds them. So there's this coin, re, an, um, a, 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 a stable coin brought up by Ripple, and there's this country now who's piloting a, st uh, a stable coin. How coincidental is it how coincidental must it be for them to be piloting and then this to come drop and stablecoin regulations are coming up? Does this stablecoin fall under the same purview? Could that change the price of XRP? Right? Because this is a different type of stablecoin. This will be a retail stablecoin. But to what structure? What structure? What's the architecture of this thing? These are the questions I have still. So... We are glad to report that after a year of development, the prototype system was successfully completed. The present report provided an overview of the Orem technology architecture. It is presented at a more technical level supplemented by user interface visualizations and should best be read in conjunction with the three EHKD papers. So here, I want to say it was yesterday I posted out XRP as a tokenized commercial bank asset is integrated into the unified ledger along with along alongside the tokenized EHKD. 
The shared program ab programmable infrastructure enables seamless exchange and settlement of XRP with the EHKD and other currencies on the ledger. Smart contracts can be used to automate various processes such as compliance checks and settlement to enhance the efficiency of cross-border payments involving XRP and the EHKD. The governance and technical frameworks uh, established by the HKMA and other central banks ensure the integration and operability of XRP within the unified ledger system. So we're talking about the EHKD there being utilized within the unified ledger system. This is from the EHKD pilot project phase one with the HKMA, Ripple, and a bunch of Visa, I think MasterCard maybe, and a bunch of other companies as well. One of the things it says there, or a few of the things it says there, in addition, an EHKD could be used in a unified ledger, a concept explored in greater detail by the Bank for International Settlements. And here we're talking about the structure now. So here's a bank and here's Ripple, right? Sort of like the central bank and Ripple. Similar structure. Fubon Bank is not a central bank for sure. Hear me out though. But look at the similar structure. You have a bank utilizing this to create a value to give to issue out that rcbdc that retail cbdc okay so fubon bank and ripple explored in their pilot the use of tokenized real estate assets in granting a home equity line of credit so ripples ex they're ex it's ex extending liquidity for credit to somebody to a real estate owner using a hypothetical ehkd when the lending protocol is triggered property lien tokens are issued so that's a security token now are issued as collateral by the bank. So that token is now backed by that property. That property value is on the ledger, okay? Um, lien token and used as collateral by the bank in minting a residential mortgage loan. So because this collateral now exists in this lien, they can utilize that to transfer into a loan to say, here you go, here's money from us. This is the smart contract from us which encompasses that loan, that mortgage information to you. There's that money. It's liquid. Bam. Done. And the loan amount for a drawdown is then credited to the owner. There it is. The owner in EHKD. So that security has now transformed into the actual dollar value of the Hong Kong Central Bank. That's how that works. That security, that value became a security token and that security token became a smart contract that smart contract then became the ehkd the hong kong dollar stable coin cbdc right a stable a cbdc backed stable coin because out in the east they're doing stable coins backed with gold russia had come out with a gold backed digital currency a stable coin which is a cbdc in the west canada and u.s guarantee they are doing the fiat style it's still two-tiered on both sides where it goes from central bank to clearing then to uh, um, commercial bank then to retail itself so two-tiered system central bank commercial bank us both west and east have that same structure except in H hkma in hong kong they were doing testing for a direct cbdc direct from the central bank to the hong kong individual itself that in the west wouldn't fly because then policies would need to change in the back end of the central bank to state how they can issue these cbdc's directly to the participant they don't want that they want to issue it to the bank to the retail commercial banks they want to do what they've always done they're not trying to disrupt the system and re you know reimagine everything again they're just converting the old system into the new digital system so everything that happened before it's going to happen again just in a different structure the process today is operationally intensive for lenders and can span multiple systems in this connection the model of token backed lending would enable lenders to provide a more efficient service to potential real estate owners to realize uh, additional liquidity which can in turn encourage uptick an uptake of such facilities so there it is, okay? There's the central bank, loan tokenized property and funds in the vault. There it is. There's the vault. There's the escrow. There's whatever you want to call it. So release tokens and funds backed by the bank, uh, funds back to the bank, repawn full, full repayment. So then, okay, how does this work? So here, the loan comes out to the vault. Then it comes out from the vault from there and into the customer's wallet. From the wallet, you can see it coming down 
over to the right hand side there make payments into the vault so when they're paying so for your mortgage you're paying back into that vault that's your own personal vault their own personal wallet or a little escrow if you will where that's being paid off so that's your own personal thing it's not one giant you know bank anymore with individual it's a it's a software with your own little boop, this is your file right there you're paying into that little vault and then then the release token and funds back to the bank upon repayment. when it's back and repaid that goes back as central bank money as wholesale money again okay i hope this is making sense to you guys here and then here i got a um a flow chart if you will so it goes the unified ledger this is what this is about so it goes the tokenized central uh bank digital money so the ehkd then it goes down to the tokenized commercial deposit or the asset then it goes to the smart contract just as i was describing to you and then it goes to the governance and the technical framework at that point so let's see that again with xrp in the middle here now so we have the tokenized central bank monies again the ehkd and then we have the tokenized commercial bank asset the real estate you see xrp in there xrp provides that tokenized issuance within the um um oh man i'm blanking here within the ecosystem there we go within the ecosystem in the landscape then you have the smart contract then you have the smart contract right which is an automated compliance automated compliance baked into it they have things like glee or um oh stellar has somebody they work with i don't remember the name right now then they have the governance 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 provenance i can't think of the name right now not important not important Jumping back, the Orem system is accomplished and is accompanied by technical manuals totaling over 250 pages that together with the source code are made accessible to all BIS members on BIS OpenTech to serve as public good that furthers the study of the RCBDC architecture. The Orem prototype also provides a solid basis for furthering the exploration and testing the EHKD design in Hong Kong. So as we're reading about this now, just picture the EHKD, okay? Just picture that. Let's just jump in there for a second. Okay, so here's the EHKD Pilot 1. So picture the EHKD, okay, from the HKMA. Here we go. Phase 1 report of the EHKD. I don't make up any of these things. I read directly from them for you, and I just put the pieces together. That's all I do. I'm here to help. That's it. Let's see who the participants are. It's MasterCard and Visa. They're both there. There's Ripple. Bottom left, all right? We have ICBC, Standard Charter Bank. We have two banks there. Here's a technology partner for offline. Uh, Geishik and... We have a retail bank here, maybe a Neo Bank, as in Za Bank. We have Fubon. There's the Fubon Bank. There, uh, the bank, the, the, the central bank, the People's Bank of China. Or is this the HKMA? That's the HKMA. And then a consulting group here. And then we have retailers here in Alipay. I'm not sure who Arda is. China Construction Construction Bank, one of China's biggest banks as well. So you can see how this is working together. Then you have retailers and Visa and MasterCard because you know they're going to be part of this. You know they're going to be part of this. So jumping back to Orem, against the backdrop, we have no doubt, no doubt about it, that the Orem prototype will catalyze and inspire the global quest for the most suitable RCBDC texture, architecture. See the, HK, the EHKD, technical perspective. Okay, 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 okay. Different types, so scope one of the experimentation. BIS research distinguishes between different types of retail CBDC. The first level of distinction the BIS draws is between the direct CBDC, which we're talking about, direct model, direct from the central bank to the end user. China did those those prototypes where customers are directly onboarded with the central bank and different forms of intermediated RCBDCs where customers are onboarded by the intermediaries. So there's the hybrid CBDC where the central bank keeps the full ledger and the instrument distributed by the commercial bank is the liability on the central bank. The intermediated CBDC, where the central bank only keeps the wholesale ledger and the instrument distributed by the commercial bank is a liability of the central bank. And then indirect arch architectures, where the central bank keeps the wholesale ledgers, but the instrument issued by the commercial bank is not a liability of the central bank and instead more akin to e-money or a stable coin. So here are the different models. So there's the direct, here's the hybrid, and then there's the inter the intermediated 
Orem Studies Intermediated CBDC and CBDC backed stablecoin. Orem, being the BIS Innovation Hub's first RCBDC project, decided to focus on the two architectures shown in Figure 1, Intermediated CBDC, also referred to here, now, here and after as just a CBDC token, and B, a CBDC backed stablecoin, or in short, stablecoin. So when you hear them say stablecoins from the central bank terms, terminologies, they are talking about a CBDC backed stablecoin. So it's a, it's a stablecoin backed with central bank money. Okay. Intermediated CBDC. The rationale for exploring intermediated CBDC is because, according to BIS research, many central banks are looking at intermediated CBDC and wishing to preserve the private sector's primary role in retail payments and financial intermediation. If a, this, this here comes from the uh, EHKD, the technical perspectives, okay? So if a CBDC is provisioned through a one-tiered system fully operated by a central bank, such an arrangement would face various operational and policy challenges. As we were talking about there, there'd be so much policy, po policy switch up and conversion and shuffling around that would need to take place. It would be a nightmare. There are also privacy concerns and potential impact on long-term innovation associated with the direct CBDC model. A CBDC is therefore best designed as part of a two-tier system with an appropriate division of labor between the central bank and the private sector intermediaries. Again, it's a stable coin wrapped with a CBDC. As such, we concluded that performing technology-driven uh, experiments in the space of intermediated CBDC by creating a code base that can be accessed by BIS member central banks for further study and experimentation would be in, would be very valuable and could help foster progress in the development of a CBDC. In Orem, we refer to intermediated CBDC issued to end users as the CBDC token, as distinct from stablecoin because the uh, CBDC token constitutes a central bank liability the stable coin does not inst does not and instead constitutes a bank liability hmm very interesting right because it's coming wrapped with the um stable coin with the the money or the value is from somewhere else it's just entrusted and wrapped with the central banking behind it at that point so it's now a liability on the banking industry because it's wrapped with private money. Beaten fully backed by the wholesale CBDC holdings in the interbank system. Woo, this is hot. CBDC backed stablecoin. While Orr and Bohm do not label CBDC backed stablecoins as CBDC given that they do not constitute a liability of the central bank, Orem decided to explore CBDC backed stablecoins because conceptually they are the closest to the Hong Kong SAR currency system where the physical bills are issued by the three note issuing banks rather than by the central banks. In other words, CBDC backed stablecoins are the digital equivalent of the current Hong Kong note issuing bank system. So it already operates like that out in Hong Kong. This is how they're running it. This is how they've been running it. Now they're just converting that operation into a digital form. Bringing CBDC backed stablecoins to life has never been done before, and we therefore felt that doing so may supplement the growing body of research on private sector stablecoins. Indeed, what distinguishes Orem from private sector stablecoins is that Orem stablecoin balances are reconciled versus real time growth settlement balances of the issuing bank and with the central bank, or sorry, with the central bank. In this regard, the system developed for the CBDC backed stablecoin is unique and can be useful as central banks look toward designing regulatory approaches with regard to private sector stablecoins, especially while seeking to design methods to verify the backing of the stablecoin. A highly topical matter. So, the backing of a CBDC with a stablecoin. Let's take a closer look at this. So here we have the Ministry of Finance, Republic of Palau. This is a stablecoin project. This is their phase one, which ended, or they had written the, docu the report up December 7th, 2023. So here we are 
Palau is asking some questions within their own documents and they're answering their questions. One of the questions, I guess two of the questions, but we're going to go through one of them right now. There's a lot of controversy surrounding Bitcoin. How is stablecoin different? A stablecoin doesn't have as many market fluctuations as the cryptocurrency market. Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency. Stablecoins differ from other cryptocurrencies because their value is linked to government issued currency or stable assets, which can include cash, bonds, gold, or any number of assets, even other cryptocurrencies. If I'm putting the pieces together, this is what we're looking at. Ripple to launch USD backed stablecoin. So Ripple is launching their own, right? This could both, it says boosting XRP ledger. If this is the stablecoin that gets utilized as a wrapped CBDC, also known as a wholesale CBDC or a stable coin, that's what we're looking at, right? We're talking about Palau there. I'm not suggesting that this is, this is the Palau structure. I don't know. I'm just trying to put the pieces together by asking questions. Ripple is set to issue a new stablecoin peg to the US dollar, bringing more utility and liquidity to the XRP ledger. Again, Palau utilizes the USD currency, fiat currency out on their island. They have helicopters that fly out buttloads, like skids, pallets worth of dollars to bring out to that island there to keep the, the good times rolling, right? That's how it goes. So they operate under the USD. They're in a pilot project that we were reading. They've accomplished phase one in December and now they're on to phase two, which has to do with offline. Ripple comes out with a USD stable back stable coin. Palau is piloting. Maybe they're just getting ready. Maybe they're just getting ready, right? I'm not suggesting that this is the Palau stable coin, but I'm, what I'm suggesting is that this is once a government or a central bank issues a CBDC, backed by the government as well the u.s government they're ahead they are as further than people think right they're further than people think leading provider of enterprise blockchain and crypto solutions ripple has announced plans to launch a stablecoin pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the u.s dollar usd the crypto providers and again they're, they're, because it's early, people are comparing it to a stable coin that's issued, say, by Circle or USDT. USDT is the next. No, that's don't even play around with that. Like that thing's ready to explode sometime soon. People are afraid to hear that narrative and they're like, what's wrong with USDT? There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. If you can't see it by now, you're missing the show. All right. The crypto providers new stable coin. Uh, will be 100% backed by USD deposit, short-term U.S. government, treasuries, and other cash equivalent. Uh, stable coins are generally considered to be less volatile in market fluctuations, other than other than other forms of uh, uh, than other forms of cryptocurrency. Bitcoin necessitates cryptocurrency mining, which uses incredible amounts of energy. Incredible. The Palau stablecoin is built with Ripple's technology, which doesn't involve cryptocurrency mining and is therefore energy efficient. Is a stable coin safe? Could I lose money? This is the Palau uh, pilot now, okay? This is what we're reading still. It is safe. The Palau stable coin is aligned and backed by US dollar, right? This means that one PSC is backed by a dollar in cash, treasuries, treasury securities, and other safe assets. The cryptocurrency provider's new stablecoin will be 100% backed by U.S. deposits, short-term U.S. government treasuries, and other cash equivalents. Are we looking at the same thing here? PSC is backed by dollar in cash, treasury securities, and other safe assets, and thus redeemable on demand. So I'm bringing you back. I'm just taking you down the value chain. Here we are at the BIS now, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, Prudential Treatment of Crypto Assets, written December or produced December 2022 by the BIS. So we were talking about that uh, for the EHKD project. We were talking about that tokenized security, that stablecoin, that security stablecoin for that value there for the smart contract. So here we are at the BIS, we are in classification conditions. So as we look at crypto asset group one, one A, so crypto assets are those crypto assets that meet classification conditions set out in SCO 60.8 to 60.19. Group one crypto assets consist of group one, tokenized traditional assets such as real estate that meet the classification conditions. It totally does. Group one B, 
crypto assets with effective stabilization mechanisms that meet the classification condition. Ripple come out with a stablecoin. BAF prudential treatment of crypto assets is all about stablecoin. The creme de la creme de la creme. This is the bank for central banks and this is what they say how this works. So everybody else down the value line has to produce this however they want to make it look. But they produce it however they want to make it look. All right. This stable coin of, by Ripple has a effective stabilization mechanism. USD cash and treasuries. How can a stable coin help Palau's economy? The stable coin will provide a universal valuable available value store and uh, payment options for Palau citizens that do not depend on a commercial bank in commercial uh, institution. They don't need a commercial bank, right? This is a central bank going right to the end user there, just like China's model. Oh, excuse me, but they don't need a commercial bank. They don't. This is the retail CBDC. You have someone like Ripple who has the stable coin. You have the government giving it the blessing. You have the central bank at this point stating that with their CBDC wrapping this stable coin now, this stable coin is a liability onto the central bank when they or, or sorry, not, it's, a, not, it's not a liability on the, on the central bank. It's a liability to the user. And uh, it's a debit. It's a credit. It's a credit on the central bank's balance sheet. There we go. And does not include banking fees and accelerate the transaction and payment times. Think a digital form of uh, physical cash. This can help avoid late fees and other bank surcharges. No bank account is necessary for citizens to use the Palau stablecoin. This will facilitate greater financial inclusion. You don't need a, a bank there. See? You don't need it directly from there to the wallet. The direct method that we're talking about in Project Aurum. This will facilitate greater financial inclusion for those who have been unable to open a bank account with with a stable coin. Money transfer can help can happen without the sender and the recipient uh, being in the same physical location. Jumping back. OK. So some of the trade-offs in the different models, as noted in, in R and BOM, different trade-offs can be observed in the different two-tier distribution models. Illust did I read this? Illustration in figure one, namely the central bank's operational burden, the level of decoupling between the wholesale and retail ledger, the central bank's responsibility to safeguard user data, and the required level of trust on the intermediaries in between there, because there's no banks. Right? I don't know how they're set up in Palau, but there are end users there are inter with intermediaries in between there. What they are, I'm not sure. There's the clearing of some sort. There is the gateway hub that's needed to go from here in the U.S. to here in Palau. There's a gateway hub. There's a system. Maybe a fast system needs to be there. Or is it... I'm not sure how Palau was connected to the U.S. and the plumbing of things yet. Uh, via, uh, aside from Ripple. Aside from Ripple. Okay? With the bank money, I don't know how they're connected. The level of decoupling between the two ledgers has implications for cyber resilience. Um, based on the principle of privilege separation or network uh, seg segmentations, the intermediated model and CBDC backed stablecoins have a higher level of decoupling and hence better cyber resilience than the hybrid model. The central bank's operational burden and responsibility to safeguard user data are also lower in these two models. However, as a trade-off and as illustrated, illustrated in figure two, these two models require a higher level of trust on the intermediaries or strong safeguards or oversight on their activities, which translates into higher supervisory burden on the central bank. The central bank has to operate either a complex technical infrastructure or a complex supervisory regime. One or the other. This is figure two. Central bank operational burden and responsibility to safeguard. So there's the, 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 the direct CBDC, how that looks. There's the hybrid, there's the intermediate, there's the CBDC stable backed, a CBDC backed stable coin. So you've eliminated some steps with the intermediate and with the CBDC backed. Environmental considerations there. They're talking about Bitcoin as always. Bitcoin is always the highest polluter. You know, you need nonsense. You need nonsense to validate Bitcoin. So let's ch check out what Bitcoin mining is all about.
other areas where mining facilities are available. Welcome to Rockdale, Texas, America's new crypto mining hub. This building that's directly behind me, inside of the buildings, we have this shelving that's a thousand feet long, 20 feet tall, and there are just miner after miner after miner after miner. We went inside North America's largest Bitcoin mine to understand how it works and its energy footprint. What is a miner? It is a small computer. They call it an ASIC miner. It is made to solve problems. And when they solve that problem, it feeds into the Bitcoin network. When it feeds into the Bitcoin network, you receive a reward. To help us understand crypto's reward system a little better, we spoke to blockchain expert Bettina Warburg. That's what mining is. It's a process by which People are contributing computing power and earning a reward for essentially participating in this process that secures a network. Everybody's using the same software that allows them to connect together and uh, participate in uh, a governance structure that's shared. It seemed like only yesterday that one person with a handful of computers crunching numbers in their apartment could make money from mining Bitcoin. So how do we go from there to here? Just like with many industries, you start small. The guy in the garage started the process. He mined Bitcoin. I believe the reward was around 50 Bitcoin for every block reward. Now it is at 6.25. In some ways, cost equals energy expenditure. This is just the nature of technology. We see updates and innovation and people driving margin and and driving their cost of operation down in order to reap the greatest reward. Um, So you get mining operations that happen in places where power is less expensive. Typically, mining operations go where energy is cheap. Right now, Texas has some of the lowest kilowatt hour prices in America. That's due in part to a deregulated energy market, which means several providers compete to snag big customers like Windstone. What have we determined? We determined that it takes a lot of energy to operate a Bitcoin mining operation there, Bitcoin farm, as you saw there, that huge amount of energy, right? So it's gonna go where energy is the cheapest. The miners are gonna go where energy is the cheapest. Why? Why would they do that? Why would miners go where energy is the cheapest? Because during the Bitcoin halving, Bitcoin halving refers to a function within the blockchain algorithm that reduces the reward um, the, for the miner reduces the reward for mining new Bitcoin by 50% to manage current, to manage the currency supply and maintain its scarcity, right? So the fee or the payout, I should say, or the reward for mining that Bitcoin is reduced. You were getting $100,000 before, now you're getting $50,000 for doing the exact same work, which means you're not getting paid enough as a miner to continue the operation of those giant farms like we've seen. So if you're a small guy, mom and pop, me and you, you're getting swallowed up. You're either, you know what, I can't afford this, it's too much, depending on where you are in the world, or you get a bigger company, you're gonna have more mergers and acquisition now. The bigger companies, they're gonna begin to buy these smaller companies, depending on how much they're worth and if they can stay alive. If not, they'll shut themselves down, go bankrupt, we're done, gonna sell everything off to the bigger companies, or the bigger companies will buy the smaller platform itself. So here I had written down Latin America has experienced a significant digital transformation and energy growth in 2024. Companies will move to places like this where energy is cheaper. This region has seen a surge in digital integration among businesses with remote work becoming more prevalent and companies embracing technology advancements like 5G and fiber optics network. Ripple, Stellar, and Quant are actively operating in Latin America, contributing to the regional, the region's digital and financial landscape. And that's how they're doing it. Um, so listen to, this, listen to what these guys have to say. These are industry legends anyway, but if you don't know who they are, uh, they're going to go around and say, hey, so Steve, go ahead and, and say hello. Thank you. Good morning, David. Uh, my name is Steve Sassi. I'm Regional Director for Latin America. Damon? Hi, I'm Damon Lim, I'm Regional Director for Asia Pacific. Hi, I'm Anne-Marie van Zadelhoff, Regional Director, EMEA. Hi, Ed Socha, uh, Insight Director for North America. Latin, Latin America was underserved for a very long time, uh, so we're seeing some tremendous growth there. I think so far this year, Q1 through Q3, we've seen about 160 megawatts of absor- absorption. Um, that said, that number could have been much higher, um, but there are some power issues in, in uh, Cretaro, which are delaying some projects. So. 
you know, most likely that number could have been in the 250, 300 megawatt range. And just just to take that back a little bit, 160 megawatts is uh, it's about 38 percent growth from last year. Wow! Yeah. So it's it's a big chunk of of commission power that's been turned up in the first three quarters. And that next year in 2024, once that power issue gets resolved in, in Creta, you're going to see much uh, faster growth yeah, in the region. Sure. So you're going to begin to see a consolidation of miners soon, right? They're going to be leaving the U.S. possibly, unless they're just consolidating and getting bigger and bigger and bigger till you get like the mining thing. Texas is known as like the mining thing of the world with oil and now crypto. And they're talking about Latin America here as well, right? Because it's cheaper. It's cheaper. It's not saturated yet. It's cheaper to operate these things. So people might migrate out to South America. If you guys operate a mining rig, by all means, go do your thing. Make some extra cash. Do you. Do you. But jumping back to stable coins now. We're looking at stable coins still. This here is Circle. His name is uh, Ragalan um, Apathy. And he explains what sparks the FOMO of adoption of stable coins. Listen to what my guy has to say, okay? Probably this is much closer to Ragulan and uh, also Vincent, do you want to comment on this? Like uh, enterprise adoption, which ones, because I think this opened up a design space, right? Not just the traditional settlement like Visa or MasterCard, right? E essentially SAPs could look into this, right? Like many other kind of enterprises could actually tap into this opportunity. But I'm sure you guys are much closer to this. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I've been working with enterprises for a long time. I, mm -hmm. I think what's more interesting is seeing these. Um, it's a stepped approach, right? Enterprises don't usually lead the market, frankly, um, if I'm just brutally Unless honest about it. To. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, like, change in a big enterprise will take a really long time. I think what you'll see is these Web2 companies, um, you know, whether they're like uh, wallet companies, gaming companies, ride hailing companies, e commerce platforms, I think you're going to see them install uh, stable coins as an option for payment and remittance and, and movement of money. And I think that will create an onward traction. And you're starting to see that with these case, use cases like SAP, for example. Um, ultimately, like, I'm not a big fan of pushing technology or solutions where there's no problem, right? And I think there's just so much latent demand for the problems that we face in the world that need to be solved today, whether that is, um, you know, dollars, exporting dollars to people that actually need it, um, you know, the use case I talked about before, like security of money, movement of money, um, and there's just so many people, like literally billions of people, especially across emerging markets um, in Asia, Africa, um, the Middle East, and, uh, and Latin America in particular, who need it and have huge latent demand for it. And I think as, uh, you know, happened like ages ago, like more than 10 years ago, I, I worked at AWS, and, um, and when Amazon Web Services broke through in the cloud, mm -hmm. yes, I was working in the enterprise division, and we were trying to convince enterprises, but the startups did it first. Yeah. They started scaling. The enterprises get FOMO and they follow. And I yeah. think that's a very typical stage of how things will happen. Yeah. And I anticipate that's exactly how it's going to happen here. We're starting to see some unlock here in Asia. Um, you know, you'll see some interesting announcements coming ahead, which will show some of that unlock starting to happen. And I think that will just create this huge wave of people going, if they're doing it, I need to do it. And then I think you'll see dramatic movements in the next sort of 18, 12 to 18 months or so with, with big brand names unlocking the availability of stable coins. Yeah. So the FOMO is what's get, what gets everybody every single time. I'm sure for the central banks too. I couldn't see why not. Why wouldn't the central banks get FOMO, you know? Someone like Palau working on their CBDC stable coin back to CBDC gets it out there and they're like oh my god oh my god this is this is happening I'm sure they do that too not just you and I right not just you and I I'm certain they do that too and they're like we gotta get it out there we gotta get it out there and they're gonna FOMO in and if you are in the right coins that adhere to regulations that are being used you will capitalize on some of that generational wealth being transferred This video describes perfectly how I view it. Jackpot, bitch! Mainnet, bitch! I'm rich, bitch! Millionaire, bitch! Billionaire, bitch! Trillionaire, bitch! Quadrillionaire, bitch! 50,000x, bitch! 100,000x, motherfucker!
Ching ching, motherfucker! Slice and dice, bitch! Unlimited and boundless prosperity and riches is coming your way now. It's coming your way, motherfuckers! Get ready! That video always gives me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I hope it does for you, too. Right? So we've gone through the environmental concerns now with Bitcoin. They're going to have to be carnivorous and start consolidating to survive or leaving offshore to survive where power is more economic out there, economical and cheaper. Section two, guiding principles of safety. One of the principal risks with digital assets is the double spend problem. The double spend problem describes the difficulty by of ensuring digital money is not easily duplicated. In other words, double spend refers to the incidence of an individual spending a balance of a particular digital currency more than once, efficiently creating a disparity between the spending um, record and the amount of that digital currency available, as well as the way in which it is distributed. The issue of double spending is a problem that cash does not have if you pay for a coffee with a $5 bill, turning that bill over to the barista, you cannot turn around and spend that $5 anywhere else. It's already gone. It's out of your hands. The Orem system is designed as such that the wholesale interbank system can be detected and prevent banks from overissuance. The system prevents banks from issuing more retail CBDC than the actual whole CBDC asset than the bank actually owns. So they can't, they cannot do that. The double issuance, so the system prevents banks from issuing the same wholesale CBDC asset to issue another RCBDC repeatedly. They cannot continually just loop and, and mint and mint and print and print like we live through now. They cannot do that. Double redemption. The system prevents banks from using the same RCBDC to exchange for a wholesale CBDC repeatedly. They can't have this wholesale here and this retail CBDC and keep repeating and you know growing their bag, if you will, with the CB art retail CBDC that was issued out. So it prevents itself from doing that. The system has redundancies within redundance on top of itself. The Orem system achieves this through the validator mechanism that can help prevent overissuance and double spending in the retail system. However, there are trade-offs in terms of performance and availability. A highly available online service and database server is required to implement the validator infrastructure in the retail system. Uh, as rightly noted by Chom, David Chom, in 2021, only online checks can effectively prevent double spending to fully eliminate the risk. The same observation would apply to over, over withdrawal of a, uh, a CBDC or over issuance of a stablecoin of these processes could be seen as double spending of the wholesale transaction. I don't want to go into that part. They go into what is a UTXO, uh, an unspent transaction, an output. So a UTXO, unspent transaction output. The TX is the transaction, is the technical term uh, for the amount and ownership of digital currency that remains after a transaction, i.e. the unspent transaction amount. The uns yeah, the unspent. Okay, moving down. Furthermore, the system also achieves greater cyber resilience. The wholesale CBDC issuance is restricted to only the wholesale system. So it can't leave that platform itself. The cross-ledger synchronization design ensures sufficient decoupling between the wholesale and retail ledgers to implement the principle of privilege, separation, and network segments. Cyber, cyber security sent, okay. So the intermediaries play the role of security gateways for the wholesale system against potential attacks from the retail system. Besides the transaction flows have been designed to minimize interactions between retail payment activities and wholesale function as to minimize the attack surface. So there you go. The central banks have their ledger, then you have the bank ledger, then you have the general public ledger. This is a unified ledger. As we were just talking about, not just, but like earlier. So here we are back. Project Orem kept referring us to this project here. Project EHKD phase one. And what we want to see is unified. So we're talking about the unified ledger now. 
So here, tokenized deposits have the potential to transform transactions in terms of visibility and execution efficacy by enabling transaction parties to integrate separate processes. Separate processes, right? Separate processes. That's what we're discussing here. Um, stakeholders and data points into a unified end-to-end -end flow. Boom. That's what we're discussing here, okay? That's what we're discussing here. I told you, you, you got, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get this anywhere else. So in addition, an EHKD, I read this earlier, could be used in a unified ledger, a concept explored in a greater detail, in greater detail by the Bank for National Settlements. All right, I read this earlier. Automated and seamlessly integrating into a common programmable platform that combines tokenized money and tokenized assets. Tokenized money and tokenized assets. So here we are at a ledger, I guess a unified ledger, if you will, on the XRPL here. This is the learning portal. Did you know that you can issue your own tokens and currencies on the XRPL, the XRP ledger? In fact, the XRPL was the first blockchain to support the tokenization of various assets. Tokens are digital assets that can be used to represent anything of value on the ledger. That means that you can issue that you can use tokens to represent real world assets, whether it's a stable coin, like the US dollar, piece of art, or physical commodity, assets, money, real world value. So now we're talking about custody services here. Let's continue the conversation with custody services here. So building for the digital asset future with Ripple. Ripple acquisition of Medical was a seminal moment for the company manifesting our belief in the digital asset future and further cementing our leadership position in blockchain infrastructure sol sol solutions the move underscores our real-time commitment to offering the critical infrastructure that financial institutions need in order to leverage blockchain technology to drive innovation i'm giving you guys the game here nothing but love i hope you guys appreciate this preparing the token economy with digital asset custody ripples vision is to build the internet of value enabling the world to move value as seamlessly as information does today and custody is an integral component of that vision without it financial institutions investors and consumers cannot use tokenized assets or move manage and tokenize value in a safe secure scalable and compliant way so to scale it to the to real world adoption of real world use here we have the announcement from medico announcing hsbc's new digital asset custody service right remember matako was with ripple we're just going down the value chain i showed you where the bis fits in i showed you where the central bank fits in i showed you how ripple fits in as the fintech here but they're now issuing a, um, a, a a stable coin and then you have the central bank issuing a cbdc and then connect you have that wrapped a cbdc backed stable coin blessed by the government if you will a USD back stable coin. We're moving this stable coin into custody services now here, right? We know that Bitcoin Bitcoin is gonna continue to run somewhere else to continue to stay alive and become more green because the cost of energy is failing it. It's failing it. So they're gonna have to consolidate and companies are gonna have to fall off the map. That's what it's gonna have to be. They can't afford to continue continue down this path after the having so now we're here at um ripple's custody services with real world assets on this unified ledger so hsbc announces today that it plans to launch a new digital asset custody service for institutional clients who invest in tokenized securities once live in 2024 i'm still waiting for this news to drop HSBC's new digital asset custody service will complement HSBC Orion. That's HSBC's uh, platform. The bank's platform for issuing digital assets, as well as HSBC's recently launched offering to tokenize physical gold. Physical gold! <laughs> Together, these form a complete digital asset offering for HSBC, HSBC's institutional clients. HSBC is working with Swiss enterprise tech firm Matako to use its institutional platform Harmonize as part of HSBC's new custody service for digital assets. Matako's Harmonize solution offers helps unify security and management of the digital assets operation. This is their platform 
scale new business model in the digital asset economy. This is the interface for the people. This is what the banks or the, yeah, the banks will interact with, right, via Matako. And then we, or whoever it is, the end user will interface with CI HSBC. That's how that, you're going down the value chains. I took you from the top of the tip of the top, top, right down to the end here, okay? Right down to the end user through HSBC. Deploy ambitious digital assets use cases. I'm, I'm man. <laughs> if I didn't just give you the game here, I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know, right? I don't know. This is how you're gonna invest in your in cryptocurrencies. This is how you're gonna do it. Majority of the world will not be opening up a digital wallet, storing seed phrases, getting a ledger for offline, and remembering these things and learning how to. Tra they're not. They're not doing it now. They will not do it then. And this is one of the fallacies of Bitcoin and the Bitcoin wallets, right? This is how people will not operate. They will not do that. I'm sorry. They want to be able to walk into their bank still, even though they don't trust it. The banks are going to offer higher interest rates on your savings account or extend more money to you to say that, hey, you know, we trust you again for some reason. We trust you, even though we're doing you a disservice. We trust you. So we will issue you money. All you have to do is pay us back. Even though you're struggling in this inflationary economy right now, all you have to do is pay us back and we'll do, what our, do our best to work with you. So here's 10 grand, right? Because we're, we're good. We're good. And if you continue to bank with us, we'll even give you 5% interest annually right annually they've gone up from 0 0.05 here in canada to up to near five to six percent now they're pushing they're trying they're trying to earn trust again so the architecture is designed with modularity and flexibility in mind with system and user functions cleanly delineated through different uh definitions of a coin based transaction and the legal arrangement of the underlying assets held in the wholesale system. That's not Coinbase, the custody service. It's just a coin based. It's coin based. So picture like your change, you know, your loonies, toonies, dollars, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, pences, pounds, whatever. The same infrastructure could be used to support both the CBDC token and the CBDC backed stablecoin. In addition, the design architecture enables private sector flexibility and innovation. The design of the UTXO transaction could be seen as a thin protocol layer, to uh, similar to the pro to the I to the Internet Protocol, or the uh, TCP/IP layer protocol stack that can be built on different configurations or technologies of the validator infrastructure. Below it and flexibility support different application services above it. It is reasonably envisioned that this thin standardized layer of the CBDC protocol stack could serve as the basis for fostering payment innovation. This thin layer, this thin TCP IP stack layer. This is a tweet I had posted out as well. XRP serves as the as an internet protocol equivalent to TCP IP. So Bitcoin Proponents argue that the XRP uh, cryptocurrency has not gained tra traction among businesses to justify its current valuation. XRP's role in Ripple's ecosystem is becoming increasingly important in determining the company's overall value. Based on this principle, XRP serves as an internet protocol equivalent to TCP IP. Is that that thin, thin stack layer we're talking about here? For instance, in Ripple's new stablecoin that's coming out, Palau working on a CBDC, CBDC back stablecoin, also known as a stablecoin, and a thin stack layer of TCP IP. I don't, I don't, man, you know, I gotta come off with this here. This is too hot. This is too hot right now. Oh, Whew. I hope you guys found value in this. I will catch you on the next one. Nothing but love. Keep learning. We making moves. We making major moves. We making moves.